Thank you, Amanda. My name's Dick Trady, and this is our Ethics and Election Committee meeting. Let's go around the table and better for ourselves for the record. Okay. I'm Steve Papoulias from Dominion Voting. And I'm Sherry Easley, a legislative aide for Mr. Trady and Mr. Steele. And Ms. Ray Jackson. And? Go ahead. Ira Perman, aide for Ernie Hall. Amanda Moser, deputy clerk. Pat Olenberg, elections recruiter. Jackie Yagel, election coordinator. Dana Latour, Dominion Voting. Well, let's get started. We first thing is uh, update of November fourth, twenty fourteen election. Um, and so Ernie's on the phone with us. Yeah, Ernie's. So we had the municipal proposition number one on the November fourth general election ballot, um, and the results came in. It wasn't close, so I don't think there will be any sort of contest with it. And so as we move forward, we'll just wait for the state to cert certify it, which I think is happening. 28th, isn't it? No. Okay. That's all my updates. <laughs> any questions from the there? Are there any questions? Share? Okay. Hello, Pete. Hi. Join us at the table, sir. We'll be joined by Pete Peterson. Amanda's going to talk to us about the November 4th election. Any questions on that? She says, yeah, it went fine. The state certifies, I think, on the 28th. So, any questions for her? Any questions for her? Uh, right now, no. Okay. Number three is the presentation on Dominion voting. All right. So, my name is Dana Latour. I'm a regional sales manager, manager with Dominion Voting. I'm joined today by Steve Papoulias, um, who is a senior project manager uh, based out of our Toronto office. I live in Sparks, Nevada. Um, so we have roughly 30 minutes or so to go over a number of, um, of topics. I've created an agenda here, um, and it will be followed by some slides. There are handouts that talk about our hardware. But in preparation for this meeting, um, Amanda said, let's talk a little bit about voting trends, absentee voting, um, and where, where jurisdictions are going from this point on. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about myself. <laughs> um, I'm a salesperson, but, um, but I have a unique background in this industry. And that is that I started um, in the Alaska Division of Elections and served as deputy director um, in 1977. And I stayed there until 1983. I worked in the state legislature off and on, um, and a couple of, of, I was a legislative liaison in a couple of departments. And then in 1995, I saw an opportunity to go back to elections and work um, in Fran Elmer's administration from 1995 until 2000. So during that vast period of time, uh, I have worked with paper ballots at a time when the state had four time zones. Um, I was with the division when we moved to punch card voting. I left the division, I came back and happened to be the chair, though. The person under, uh, with responsibility of selecting a new voting system for the state. So I led the committee that selected the AccuVote OS units. In, 19, in 2006, I came back and sold the state touchscreen. So I had this long experience. Um, and, then in, and then in 2000, I decided, my husband decided he could not live in Juneau anymore. He hated the rain. And we moved to Nevada, so I went from a community with you know, 340 days of measurable precipitation a year to a community with 340 days of blue sky a year. And in doing so, I became a salesperson for a company that was later acquired by Dominion Voting. So I have this broad background. I have, uh, unique that I have the opportunity to sell, and yet I have the experience of being an elections administrator. So, um, so it, it sort of positions me to talk about where we've been and where we're going, which leads me to the, to the next and the first topic um, of our presentation today. So what's happening with voting technology, right? It's not, you know, I, when I started in this business as a salesperson, people felt like we sold boxes. And in fact, we generally, in our presentations, talk about boxes, right? There's a box back there, it happens to be a scanner. 
you know, you can consider your Acubotes a box. But the reality is the underpinnings of all that we do is software and, um, and service. So those are the things, a box is a box, I promise you all of the voting systems out there count ballots. The things that set us apart is when a company designs its software, where is that software going to take you? And when a company puts feet on the street in your ju jurisdiction, what is their breadth of knowledge, their breadth of experience? Those are the things that set us apart. So in a, in a time with like technology that changes every 15 minutes, we're finding out that the AccuVote OS units used by all of you were actually designed in 1991. They were designed and they worked really well until the manufacturer of the memory cards quit manufacturing the memory cards because there's no marketplace for them. So, and that's going to be the case for all technologies from this day forward. If you bought a phone five years ago, I'm sure you're going to say this, you know, this phone is, is outdated, but what can I do with it now? I can't upgrade it. So, rather than continue to build election products that have a you know, finite lifetime, Dominion decided, okay, we're going to build an election management system, an EMS, comparable to GEMS, the software that runs AccuVotes, and we're going to make that single piece of software not only work today in boxes that count ballots, or scanners, commercial off-the-shelf scanners that scan ballots and then, you know, port them over to a, a tabulation system, and and determine how the votes are, are tallied. But we're going to design an election management system that will allow and does allow internet voting. So my colleague, Steve, just ran 18 elections in Canada on the internet because they don't have the security restrictions that we currently operate under. The, Canada is not required to have their voting system certified. So we're already doing internet voting. In May, we will be running a pilot election in Denver, Colorado, using a commercial office shelf tablet, an iPad, right? Something. So it doesn't really matter what that vehicle is, because we've designed the software that we can make work with technologies that change. We do Yule Kava voting, which means we can get a ballot, we can, we can provide to you the means of getting a ballot to a military and overseas voter, or even, you know, perhaps a, a voter living outside of the country. But if um, process or, or procedures allowed us, we could deliver that that ballot to a voter who can't make it to the polls. Do they can interrupt you for a minute? Oh, yeah. Just let the minutes reflect that Paul Holman joined us. Thank you. Paul, this is Dana. Yeah. Go ahead, ma'am. Right. Sorry. So, um, so after, you know, you can interrupt me at any time, and you, you raise a very good, good point there. If, uh, if you have a question, just stop me. But, um, but I just wanted to start this with letting you know that what we're demonstrating today is not the end all of what we have to offer. It's, it's the specific product that we've been asked to talk to you about. But there's a, a, a good range out there of, of options. Um, that we'll be expanding in, in the in, you know, future years and months to come. So one of the things we're talking about in this state, there's a dialogue we've been joined by, by some clerks from other jurisdictions, is vote by mail. And I was asked to give a little background on vote by mail. Um, and it's an interesting phenomenon because, because I have up here on the slide Western trends. So the West, Western part of the United States has the largest percentage of um, absentee voters. Oddly enough, the only states that are all vote by mail right now are in the West. I think it has to do with sheer geography, right? And you go back to Atlanta and, and a couple of things. Geography, our voters demand it because it's too hard to get to a precinct. And you go to a, a back east, and the counties are much smaller, and the, the population is much more dense. Um, Alaska, in the 1990s, passed legislation that said you no longer needed an excuse to request an absentee ballot. Many states across this country still require you to give an excuse to ask for an absentee ballot. Back in the early 2000s, we came up with no fault, or early 1990s, no fault absentee. Well, other western states adopted that. So what we started seeing 
was jurisdictions that went from having 10% absentee to 40% absentee, 50% absentee. So what happens then? You know, if you have a if you have a precinct with a thousand voters and you have 50% turnout, and 50% of those people who are turning out are requesting and receiving an absentee ballot, suddenly you are holding two elections. You are doing all of your process and all of your preparation for a vote by mail election, while a total of 25%, right, follow the math, 1,000 voters, 50% turnout, 50% get an absentee ballot, you are now holding an entire parallel second election for 25% of your voters. The amount of work that goes into your jobs with the precinct election is the same, whether you have 10% turnout or 80% turnout, the process is the same. You have to find a polling place, you have to beg for poll workers, you trade them, you pray they you know, show up. Um, so that was happening across the West. California, I, I used to sell in that marketplace. I sold counties, essentially two systems, and more than 50% more than of their voters, people who actually turned out were receiving absentee ballots. So, <clears throat> In 1998, Oregon adopted a vote by mail process. In the mid 2000s, Washington State, for all of the reasons I just discussed, said we're done with precinct elections. And the final couple of, um, of counties moved over in the last four, four years or so. And then just the last year, in 2013, Colorado said, okay, we're going vote by mail. But there was a step in, and I kind of jumped over it, that uh, vote center in the center of the page. So what we started seeing in some jurisdictions before they made the leap from precinct elections to all vote by mail was a concept called vote centers. And what happens with vote centers is if you have a county that pre previously had 125 precincts, the county, and I, I'm gonna use the word county because most of the country elections are administered by counties. Um, so the county would say, okay, I've got 12 sites that are big enough, the, the fairgrounds, you know, the couple of libraries, a couple of big locations, malls that are standing empty, where we can send all of the voters. So if I happen to live in a precinct, quick thing to think about an example, on Huffman Road, Huffman Road, right? That's my precinct, but I work down at Ship Creek. And I don't get to my precinct on election day. I could go to the Ship Creek vote center, and there they would have all of the ballots for the entire jurisdiction. They would have connectivity so that as soon as I cast my ballot in Ship Creek, my name was flagged in every vote center in the community so I couldn't cast a second ballot. So that was kind of an interim step that Colorado went to before they decided to go vote by mail. So there's lots of ways to skin this cat. But for the next little bit, I'm gonna talk about vote by mail. So people ask, and my customers, I, so, so call, Washington State is my, um, my, one of my current sales territories. Um, and so I, I'm gonna talk about what Washington State has seen as they move to vote by mail. Um, so the question is, what does this do for turnout? And um, it, as an election administrator, you know, you wanna work really hard to, um, to make, like, I mean, are, are, are you judged by turnout? No. Does a higher turnout make you feel better? I think yes, right? All that effort was, was recognized by your voters. It certainly reduces the cost per voter when, when you get more than 18 or 20% of your voters turning out. So the bottom line is yes, over time, vote by mail does increase turnout. If you compared elections that were done, precinct-based elections to vote by mail elections in the past, precinct in the past to vote by mail, you will see a slight rise in turnout. Over time, that it goes up again higher. However, the number one factor that increases your turnout are measures, issues. So if you have a simple election, as there was a fire district election in the municipality in King County, Washington recently, you know, they, they still had less than 30% of their voters show up because it just didn't grab them. However, they have really high turnouts in elections when they're statewide candidates or you know, local candidates, the mayor of Seattle. Every time that, that um, 
offices on the ballot, their turnout spikes. And when I say spikes, I'm talking about, you know, 70, 80 percent. They, I mean, so they, it, does, it brings voters out when there is an issue for a candidate that they're drawn to. So over the course of the last couple of days, we've talked about obstacles. I've heard, I've heard clerks talk about obstacles in the um, conference that we've just been attending. So these are specific to the, to the state of Alaska. So what are the obstacles? I think, I think um, that the, the obstacle that comes most quickly to my mind is um, voter registration. There is a unique situation in the state of Alaska in the fact that the state administers all voter registration. Every other jurisdiction in the, in the U.S. Local jurisdictions, most often counties, are responsible for voter registration and they upload those totals to a statewide database. In Alaska, when the Constitution was written, you know, think back to 19, whatever, 58, 59, um, we had this vast territory with nobody living in it. So they said, the, the, the drafters said, well, we're going to have one entity take care of it, it happens to be the state. So that was years ago, but it is the way it stands today. The voter registration system used by the state of Alaska right now is called VRIMS. I built the requirements for it in 1983. It is, here we are at 2015, you know, it's an ancient, antiquated system. The state is in the process of revising it and is working with the contractor right now. It is, I think, the hopes of the clerks in this room, and certainly, um, I'm hoping that it's a legislative discussion or a municipal discussion is as the state rolls out this new system that they will make available to the clerks access to the records and the signatures of the voters in their jurisdiction. Because the second obstacle in moving to vote by mail is a way to confirm that the envelope that you are about to open and tally, right, you send out ballots to every registered voter in the jurisdiction. How do you verify, confirm, that that envelope coming back is that of the voter in your area? The reality is, they're doing it right now. So, you're already tabulating absentee ballots. You already have a process. And the process in the state is, they sign an oath. I sign an oath as a voter that says, I am Dana Latour and I'm casting my ballot, and you have to have it witnessed. So if you can find enough people to commit this election fraud, like by stealing ballots out of the mailbox and lying on an oath and signing a signature that isn't yours and having two people attest to the fact that it's not your signature, then there's a bigger problem, but it's not vote by mail. <laughs> so so there, the obstacle is not really an obstacle. There's a process in place that allows for it now. But there's also technology in place that would make that process easier. And that technology will occur when the state gets their UPR system. And will occur if you guys are successful in finding a way to convince the state and, and, the, and the folks who are building this software to allow you read only. And, um, and I don't have a dog in that fight. It's just, this is just me talking. So we've talked about where vote by mail happens, what their experience has been, what the obstacles are, because there are other obstacles. You're going to have those political discussions that, I'm, you know, that I, again, I don't have a dog in the fight, but there will always be people who say, your constituents who say, I don't want people don't generally turn out to vote to come turn out to vote. Or they're going to say, how are we going to make sure that this is the ballot of the person that says it's their ballot? Um, so anyway, moving, be, you know, moving beyond that, because those are things that I can't control, what I can demonstrate to you and talk about is how we are um, working with customers who are moving to vote by mail, or, or even if they're not moving to vote by mail, who have a really high volume numbers of absentees. And that's what we're going to talk about with a couple of slides. And then we can set it up in the back, and, and Steve will go right and balance if you really want to see how the system works. You have questions about how I've teed it up to this point? Questions about the process? Well, 
The only thing, and I apologize for getting here, Louie, um, we're talking vote by mail, we're still talking the paper ballot mail back, mail yes. to you and mail back, not electronic. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So my discussion about the ability to electronically send ballots is just to talk about where the technology, because it will change, because technology is changing us, um, where technology is going and what's happening in other parts of the country, in Canada and around the world. So, and I and my my point in having said that is that we operate in all those markets. You know, we we have elections all over Canada, and we operate internationally. So so it was kind of tooting our own horn, horn a little bit about saying we're positioning ourselves to be agile, to be on our toes, to be able to respond as the technologies respond, change. So. Is the state working at all to you as a clerk? Is she redoing? She said they're redoing the voter registration <coughs> system. Are they interfacing with you as a clerk here? Um, to be sure. So the clerks met in February with Dominion Voting, and Gail Fanumiai was at that meeting, and we did have a conversation about the signatures, but that is the only conversation we've had so far. That is my number one item on the list to move forward is having the access to signatures. And so would it help if you gave us some resolution and wants to send the legislature to the state? That we could run through the assembly and send it down there to tell them what we want to see happen. To make um, it easier for you to do the elections. I think we could explore some options moving forward as to starting that conversation. You could explore them and appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No. Thank you. Um, so, ImageCast Central is our product name. Um, what we offer is, a, a, and I think the key in this is a scalable, which I'm not sure that that's a word, but we certainly use it a lot, a scalable solution for the tabulation of, of ballots. We made a, a decision um, as a company to move from having a proprietary piece of hardware to commercial off-the-shelf scanners um, simply because it's less expensive for our customers and the real practical side of that is can, and, and we selected Canon. Um, Canon has maintenance people, service people all over this country. I'm sure they're in Fairbanks. I'm sure there's one in Juneau. I know there's some here in Anchorage because I googled it yesterday. Um, so why would we want to create a large piece of hardware and send them to jurisdictions all over the country and then have to be poised to run there if they didn't, didn't work and the only way we can get there in a hurry is by charging you exorbitant fees for your maintenance agreements. So we decided the best way to go was to choose a vendor and we chose Canon. And we chose Canon because they have um, a great history but they also do high volume scanning jobs all over the country credit card companies, hospitals, imagine all the documents that are still um, <clears throat> So because we're using an off-the-shelf scanner, it scans up to a 22-inch ballot. Because it's scalable, you can essentially determine the number of ballots that you need to count, make a determination. These little, the scanners that we're showing scan 130 ballots a minute. If you have a high volume, you just start adding scanners. Yes, every scanner will require a person to push the start button. But, and while it says it scans 130 ballots a minute, um, the reality is in elections, and I, we have a, a competitor who says that their scanner scans 8,000 ballots an hour. Well, that's great, that's really sexy, that's really fun. But what happens when your accountability says you only had 7,800 ballots in and you had 7,800 ballots, and, the, and the, your report says you have you know, 7,790 ballots. Now you have to rescan 8,000 ballots. So, um, so the reality is, while they say they scan 130 ballots a minute, the average batch that you scan is somewhere between you know, 75 and 150 ballots. There are minutes between each of those, right? You scan 100 ballots, and you have to do some accountability, and there's some physical transfer of the ballots. But for the purpose of this discussion, this is what you do. The more ballots you need to tabulate, factored by the number of hours in which you want to tabulate them, gets you to the determination of how many scanners you need. 
one of the obstacles for the state of Alaska, the municipalities here in the state, to move to vote by mail is your requirement to tally ballots on election day only. Is that correct? Is that what I heard? You count only on election day? So, imagine going from, what's your turnout now, your absentee ballot count now? Um, this past year we had like 2,800 requested and we had like 2,000, 2,200 set back in. Okay, so I'm gonna say 2,000 because this is easy, right? So you guys have about 200,000 registered voters. If you have 50% turnout, that's 100,000 ballots you have to count. You counted 2,000 in your last election. So now what has to change? Your requirement to tally ballots only on election day is an obstacle to moving the vote by mail. Every place that has a high volume, whether it's all vote by mail or just high volume, California being an example with high volume but not all vote by mail, change their statutes to allow the processing, the word processing is different than tabulating, the processing of ballots during a longer period of time. Ballots come back and it you know, kind of a, kind of it rises, right? You mail them out three weeks or a month before they start coming in right after people get them. Splat. Then suddenly it, so you get closer to election day, the, the, the curve starts going up <clears throat> and it peaks in the couple of days before the election. And because it's vote by mail, you get ballots after election day from the post office. So that at, you, know, you have the election and then you, your line goes up for a few days. You can't, so if on election day is your highest volume day, the day after the election, <clears throat> um, that's the day you're going to be doing the most scanning. But you should not have to be doing all of your scanning on election day. You really need that window. So that's another obstacle. <clears throat> so one of the things about our system, I've, I've tried to make this generic about the process and the obstacles and you know, things you need to consider. But one thing that we do that's patented that no one else can do is, how do I know? Because the same voters say, how do I know that my ballot on the touch screen counted the way I marked it? Those same voters say, how do I know that optical scanner is counting my paper ballot correctly, even though you still have the paper ballot documents? You'll get the same question. How do I know that when I run 100 ballots through that scanner, that scanner is counting my ballot the way I marked it? This is how you know. It's called audit mark. So when you vote on our system and you select Abraham Lincoln as president, at the bottom, because we moved to the world of digital scanning, right? It's taking a picture of the front and back of every ballot that it reads. On the bottom of that picture, which is represented over here on this side, there's a uh, file, and it is an audit of every ballot that was, or every selection that was made on this ballot. So down there in that corner, it will say Abraham Lincoln received a vote for president, and it will tell you how much of the oval was complete. Audit mark. What that means is if you find yourself in an election contest or a recount, you will never have, you know, that famous picture from the 2000 election, the people staring at a ballot, or my, you know, my history of being at a table with the Democratic attorneys and the candidates, the Republican attorneys and the candidates, and people are arguing over, does this count or not? Or how did this count? Well, that's how it counted, and there's no question about it. So one of the headaches for elections administrators dealing with large numbers of absentee ballots is when a voter does things like marks their ballot at the dinner table and the ballot comes back with macaroni and cheese or they use a crayon or lipstick or someone at this conference said they received ballots back where people put on lipstick and kiss the ballot. Um, so when you get those ballots back, you have to, I mean, they don't, they don't count, right? You have to do something with them. Traditionally, you have sorted those ballots and you have made a pile that needs to be physically duplicated. And now you give it to a board and they take the ballot, they duplicate the ballot, and they have to keep this stack, you know, from not scanning, but this is the stack that scans and they have to put them back together. It's called ballot duplication. If you're an elections administrator, you never know how many of those you're going to do. So in today's technology, we've come up with the ability to adjudicate, to make corrections, to enhance ballots electronically through the use of a screen and a software program. That Remember, we're scanning ballots and it's putting 
all of the ballots that count right in a bucket that you know goes to tally, and then it's putting all the ballots that have issues in another bucket. And those ballots in that bucket can be brought up on the screen just like just like we saw here, right? And you can say, if this was an overvoted race, and if this is a vote, oh, this is a vote for two, but if this was a vote for one, and the person had said, you know, I would never vote for the Chicago White Sox, I meant to vote for the Blackhawks, that's voter intent. So rather than duplicate that ballot, you could correct that race based on voter intent. Now instead of just having one audit, you would have a secondary audit on that image that said, during adjudication, we corrected the ballot, and this is how we interpret it. Are we good? Questions? Yes, we're good. We're good? Okay. We're good. So, it's a lot of words. I think I said most of it elect electronically out in stacks. You can zoom in on the uh, the ballot issue. Well, here's, here's uh, <clears throat> okay, so in this example, if voters completely correctly filled in the oval on a ballot every time, your jobs would be really easy, but they don't. So you ask them to use an oval, and they use a check mark. And you can see on this ballot, perhaps, that the check mark sort of hits the oval. It's, it hits the oval enough to, to count, but it could be called into question. So what you can do with our software is actually hover over this race, and it, it, it colors it in a different color and you are enhancing that voter's selection so that there's no question of what that, that ballot, how that ballot was counted. And this is just a screen that shows for write-ins. Do you have write-ins in municipal elections? Okay. So how would you add a write-in uh, into, the, into the mix? You're scanning ballots. Do you have registered write-ins where they tell you ahead of time? Okay. But if there was a write-in campaign and you were sure that there were going to be a significant number of votes before election day, you could actually add in the election management system, you know, the name of, of Dana. You know I'm running a write-in campaign. But but if not, then you can um, you could do it here. If this was Mickey Mouse, you could just hit reject because Mickey Mouse has got a real candidate and accept that change. And then you would get, receive a report of every write-in name that we scan. That's my presentation. We've got some hardware back there. Steve will run ballots. But more importantly, my goal for being here was to make sure that you got the information that would be helpful for you. If I have jumped over something because of uh, uh, the window of opportunity we have, ask me about it. You've got my time, and I'm satisfied if you're satisfied if you have questions that I haven't done my job. Are any questions? Ernie? It's golfing. <laughs> He's probably getting creased on both sides of the yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the, the one thing that I haven't gotten yet, and uh, Amanda, you may be able to do this offline, uh, I, we're anxious to get some idea about what the cost would sure. be sure. Uh, for getting into all of this equipment. Sure. You know, it's free to you. <laughs> but if you stay in California only, <laughs> so, so, so part of it. Um, Give me a break, Dan. <laughs> so, so I can give you a broad brush ballpark. Um, but really, the key to that is how many days you're going to have to count your ballots, right? Because, because if you had a. You have, that, that was my my question. Is well, she's she's getting us there. Do you have to count them all? Spread over a bunch of time, or do, you, do some folks still do that on the day only? So most jurisdictions that have high volume have moved to multiple days, okay. because simply because of the accountability. The key is when you get a tray of ballots from the post office. There are several steps that you have to go through. The first is some sort of sorting, some sort by precinct. Then there's some sort of verification. And you open the envelope, so you want to know how many, you want to keep track of every envelope that comes through your door. That takes time. So there's time from the day the envelope comes through the door before it ever gets to the scanner. So 
You just couldn't do it all on election day. Getting back to cost. Mm -hmm. So, I ran numbers. I don't think you want, I, I, I came up with four scanners. It would be a 15 hour day if you only got to count on election day. Using four scanners, counting all day long, and including minutes, we're talking minutes, a minute to run a batch, Let's say it's three minutes to prep it, take it away, to do your accountability. So now you're at four minutes. So it ends up being, with four scanners, a 15-hour day. I don't think you want a 15-hour day. So, but with four scanners and software based on the number of voters in your community, in the, in the municipality, and shipping equipment here and training and being here in the first election and helping you program your elections, um, it's and without the who's your buddy, who's your pal deep discount, it's about $200,000 for the purchase of the hardware and the first year. And Ernie, did you get that? Ernie? Yes, I did, Dick. Okay. Uh, so. another, another quick question while I'm um, off mute here. Uh, I heard the, the thing addressed about signature validation. Uh, can you explain that to me just a little bit? Well, in, in Alaska, at this point, you can't do signature validation. So in Alaska, you sign an oath that says, I am who I say I am, and I cast my ballot. So all of those envelopes have to be reviewed. In the future, and in other jurisdictions that have captured signatures over time, there are programs that allow you to um, Verify the signature. To verify the signature. And it is done through, I mean, and, and we have jurisdictions that have designed their IT departments or have designed their own signature verification. You've got a you've got a, a laptop, you've got a barcode scanner, you've got two files. One is the master file that has you know my registration number, my my voter number, and my signature, and then you have a tray of envelopes that have that same voter number on the envelope and a signature. And we have folks who take a barcode scanner and a tray of envelopes and they hit scan and that first one pops up and there's the signature and they do a side-by-side -side verification. And you move through a tray of envelopes, you know, that, that way. There are others um, where you can buy Pitney Bowes, for example, has um, a piece of hardware that you put the Again, the key in all of that is the capture of the signatures by the voter registration system. So Pitney Bowes and other companies uh, sell scanners that you stick the envelopes in, and it runs through the scanner, and it's clipping that voter registration number and that signature, and it's sending it to a file where it's cross-checked. It uses the same technology as banks when they run checks through a scanner and it sets a confidence factor. You're gonna say, I'm gonna accept every signature that has 65% of the same you know, loops, or 40%, depending on how many you wanna go back and verify. You set it, you run the envelopes through there, and it gives you a report of the envelopes in the tray that don't have the confidence match to the signature on file. Does that make sense? Here, Ernie? Yes. Okay. Yes. Anything else, sir? Uh, how many uh, of the the three western states that do it, do any of those do signature validation? Um, all of them. They all do a signature validation? Yes, okay. yes. So the, so the biggest and most immediate hurdle in for Alaska is getting the signatures. And I think, I think you've come up with an excellent idea with regard to your, your resolution to this, the legislature. Anything else, Ernie? I'm good, Dick. Thanks. Okay. Paul, Pete. Yes, Pete. You know, just just to throw out something else for the committee to to think about, and you know, you, you do this for a living. Um, are there states that are in the process of getting ready to go completely vote by computer? Uh, no. The reason being. Um, most states 
statutes, and it's changing, but um, require the jurisdiction to have certification by a federal agency called the Elections Assistance Commission. It was uh, created during the Help America Vote Act. They created a, an entity that basically held the purse strings and made sure that states complied with the requirements in order to receive the grants, the bought touch screens basically for ADA voters. Um, <coughs> as a vendor, in order to sell in this country, we have to have our entire cert system certified. It is, they are tested, regardless of which vendor, by independent testing authorities. There's a test plan written. Initially, it takes a couple of million dollars and up to six years to bring a product to market in the States. You go through this very long window of certification, development certification, and finally you get an EAC number. And now we have to take that EAC number and we have to take it to every state where a number of states have a secondary certification process. The fact that there are no standards for voting by computer, and because there is that requirement to have it tested, prevents us from doing the kind of voting that my colleague does in, in Canada, right? They, so he's doing internet voting, he's managing internet voting accounts because they don't have those requirements. Will we as a nation? Okay, go ahead and I'll ask you. So, um, so what happened with the EAC is suddenly there was discourse and then we had board members drop off and they appointed new board members, but board members couldn't get confirmed back in DC. The funding was cut and the agency is basically a shell. It's there as a vendor. When we're in certification, we still have to do all of those steps. It's just that there is a, um, someone has been given the authority to actually do the sign off without having to bring the four board members together and vote. Um, but consequently, what's happened over in the EAC over the last couple of years is there's been no development to consider where technology is taking us. So what some states are doing is they're moving away and not requiring the EAC certification, but no one yet is as aggressive, as progressive as what you're suggesting. Do I think we'll get there? Yes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think Alaska is uniquely positioned to possibly be the first state to go 100% uh, vote by computer. And the reason for that is, is because no other state has a permanent fund dividend that they give out. And uh, the vast majority of people in Alaska who would be voting uh, receive a uh, permanent fund dividend. And so the state has already, already got their signature and their information. And, and they've got their, online. they've got their, you know, Alaska ID and, and everything. And You're my I, Alaska. My Alaska, right. So, you know, I'm, I'm I'm just trying to, you know, think ahead and throw throw all the questions and possibilities out there. So, so whether you go with um, something like a vote by mail system or uh, electronic voting, uh, or even the optical scan, um, one of the points that Dana uh, touched on earlier was that it's uh, the the election management software. It's one software that we use to program any of those channels. So it's not like you'd have to get a, a different piece of software. Uh, it's, it's, it's one channel, we do all the divisioning and, um, and the ballots and program them in that same piece of software, uh, whether you use the vote by mail uh, scanner or optical scan or electronic voting. And this is something that um, we have done in, in many other jurisdictions as well. Anything else? Paul? Oh, sorry. I did Amanda Paul. <coughs> well, I did. go ahead, Amanda. Amanda? Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, to the chair. I remember the last time I was at one of the presentations, there was a component of this that if we had a by mail election, that people could still access electronically. So what if somebody was abroad and unable? Yeah, sure. And that is, so, and, and, yeah. and that's, that's that's correct. Okay. So so uh, Amanda is, um, is asking, and, and all of these jurisdictions I talked about that are all vote by mail, I offer it as well, okay. you know, through the use of service centers or a drop-off box, some place where voters who, who didn't receive their ballot in the mail or lost it or dog ate it or they, or they have accessibility requirements can go and cast a ballot using like a, a precinct tabulator kind of device. 
Is that that was your question, or? Well, and wasn't there also like an electronic component where they could request a ballot? Oh, like through, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like through Yule Kava or something. I mean, the yeah. same sort of program that's in place for our military and overseas voters. Yes, is a short answer. If someone else needed it for whatever accessibility reasons. Yeah. Okay. Did have a problem? Anything else, Paul? Um, you said two hundred thousand, roughly, the first year, based on what you know is the ballpark uh, assessment. Uh, Follow-up years? Sure. Um, so follow-up years. So right now, we provide, right, Dominion Voting is the company that acquired the AccuVote, so we're your current vendor. Um, so we are providing assistance to the municipality right now with the, I do the layout of ballots, and then we have somebody here on election day, or yeah, we- Yeah, Irene comes twice. Yeah, yeah. So, so if that continued, those same kind of costs would be out there. But ongoing costs with any new voting system and your current voting system is you pay us an annual software license fee. That software license fee is 20% of the cost of the software. So if the cost of the software for the municipality of Anchorage was $60,000, and I'm just pulling a number out because I don't have a price chart in front of me. If it were $60,000, 20% of that would be $12,000, an annual license fee on that. You would want um, a maintenance agreement, not through us, but through Canon, because if a scanner goes down on election day, you, you know, you want multiples of everything in the elections world, but what we're offering you is something that can be repaired here locally. You would want a maintenance agreement through Canon. There is also a firmware charge for the hardware, it's you know, it's paying us for the for the cost of certification and for the development of the product, um, and then any any support we offer you. So those are the four things: license on the software, firmware on the hardware, uh, maintenance agreement on the hardware, and any other services. Do you want us here on election day like we are now? Those kind of things. Yes, sir. Uh, is the is it just a single software purchase? Doesn't matter how many machines. It's just yes. Yeah, it's based. The software purchase is based on uh, number of registered voters. Okay. So that's basically. So we have a we have ranges, right? Because okay. yeah. through the chair, if we were able to get by with say two scanners, because we statutorily changed the number of days we're allowed to use it, would that have a big impact on it? Yes. Yeah. So um, it would it would reduce it. I mean, by tw you know twenty five thousand dollars per scanner, basically. So for the for the purpose of this, yes, that's a that is a Canon off the shelf scanner. There is a Cofax board in it that we modify, um, and and essentially you know you're paying us for our development. There's a there's if you look if you Google that scanner, it's going to come up less than twenty five thousand dollars. But the reality is. You're, you're, you're paying us for, for how we got there. I'll be Googling that. Yeah, that's appropriate. Thank you. I was just going to ask the exact same question. We're on the same page. I was that. So I probably want an extra scanner just to be safe because I want to make sure. I wouldn't want to call somebody here and want an extra scanner. I would just in case. Yeah. 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 That's a backup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So if we switch to the vote by mail, we're obviously still going to have some vote in person locations because some people are not going to go for the vote by mail. Um, so and we found this out when Amanda made a presentation over at the Bartlett Club a few months ago. There was one gentleman there that was adamant about the fact that he was going to vote in person no matter what. Yep. And so, uh, uh, so, sure. so, so, so we're going to be using the old. Accu scanners at those. No, we or? sell, and, and so I, and that's not in the that's certainly not in my ballpark quote that I gave you a while ago. But it's about well, I don't know. So about I'm going to say four thousand dollars, right, for an additional scanner. Um, it looks like an AccuVote, but an AccuVote is an old optical scan system, and today's technology is digital scanning, and they operate on two different softwares. So you can't 
commingle them. Um, so we do offer a scanner that looks exactly like an AccuVote, rests on top of a ballot box. You just insert a ballot into it. Um, that is done in every jurisdiction that is all vote by mail. They they call them service centers. So you know, if I were a voter that, that wanted to vote independently, um, that scanner would be used for that voter as well. And uh, and one of the other components, one of the other things to consider is if people don't want to mail it in, but they want to hand deliver their ballot to you, do they all come here or do you want drop boxes? That's what they're called in, in, in Washington State. We, through the chair, we added drop boxes to our code last year when we okay. in preparation for this. So we've already started to look at that too. And then are we looking at 2016 to start to do the vote by mail? That's Other questions? We've got our visiting clerks here. Do you guys have any questions? Okay. So where we go now, Steve? Did you want to show us what you're doing? Sure. Right. So. Uh, machine and see if you're tabulated. Put it up to your eye, Ernie. Hey, Dick, thanks, thanks for cheering for me today. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Not a problem, Pete. I just hope you don't enjoy being down there. Yeah, but next time, Dick. <laughs> well, hit them straight. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Take care, Pete. So, we just marked up a number of ballots and, of course, crumpled some, folded some, because they're not always going to come back in. Should you put lipstick on some of those, too? Uh, Johnny? Johnny. Oh, that, I'm going to see. They... <laughs> Not doing it. It's <laughs> just brand new set. I'm printing. So they get opened up, sorted, stacked, put the stack in there. And just press scan. And it'll start scanning. No. And it reads both sides at once. That was fast. Yeah. Did, did, did so, all nope. So on one of them, so it'll tell you, it'll flag, and you can set it this programmatically to stop. Where you can see it. If there's. So this can be set to stop on overvotes or stray marks, write ins. And what we're starting to see is we've run these ballots over and over this week. So we're starting to pick up all kinds of extra marks. So we're starting to see this one. Yeah, so you can you can get it to stop on overvotes or any other exceptions like that. And then, um, or you can just get them to scan through. Now here I've already scanned in several. And I can accept this batch. And I can just continue on. I can also remove the ballot that causes this to stop. I can put it aside if it needs further review, and then I can add this back to the file. You could also set it to scan everything without stopping, but spool off all the ballots that need review, right? So scan, never stop, and put every ballot that has one of those overvotes or a write-in into an electronic bucket. And it's through the use of adjudication that I talked about earlier. So you can scan a high volume get a report that said there are three ballots in this that need review. And, and at the adjudication station, people would just be reviewing those and making those decisions. But they wouldn't actually be looking at the physical ballot. They would be looking at the, at the image. At the image, okay. Yeah. I'll accept those. And then I remove the ballot that um, we've had an overvote on it. And so I'm just going to continue with the rest of them. Um. Now, Dan, does the state change the river shame rate? Because no, I know we read the active vote from them. Are they changing? Um, so, so, yeah, so what is the state doing? So, um, so the state is concentrating their efforts this year, in this odd, off election year, on the implementation of the new voter registration system. 
that means they are probably not going to consider a new voting system in a presidential election year, but more likely in 2017. Now, all bets are off because there's a new administration. So we don't know. But that's the conventional wisdom, and that's what we knew before the 4th of November. So, Jennifer, you list um, Uh, we'll list the batch number, the batch size, and then the total ballots that were accepted, and then average uh, average number of ballots per batch. Um, further on, I could go in, and we've just scanned those batches, but uh, Dana showed you um, the audit mark, and here I've got a folder with all the batches that were scanned on this machine. And so if you had multiple machines, you would have you know one labeled scanner one, scanner two, and then you'd have all the batches listed for those. Uh, I could go in here and I could look at the images. Okay. And so I voted for chocolate. I voted for yeah. Um, of course on the back. There's a question on the back of the ballot because it was a double-sided ballot. Um, and as Dana was showing earlier, there's the uh, patented, patented audit mark at the bottom of every image. And it shows exactly how uh, the voter voted, um, ensuring they have clear voter intent. And so for every single ballot that things get scanned through, you have an image of that. Question, Paul? Me? Question here? Amanda, any questions? Oh, you? <laughs> Hopefully, you'd be running this thing. Well, then, she's an expert. The graphics. So we, this is designed to be simple, right? I mean, if you go back to the to the software that you know, there was an icon that said I'm centrally scanning. There's a big button that says scan. The check mark that says accept. So we tried to make it. As user friendly, the interface is possible. No, is this Canadian coming to the box? Right, yeah. uh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I saw the Dominion. I figure it's got to be Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of a long sorted history. So what happened was uh, Dominion Premier, right, the company that created the Acumos, was sold to our biggest competitor in September of 2009. And within weeks, nine attorneys general filed suit saying that company had an unfair market advantage because we had 30% of the market share and they had 40% of the market share and suddenly they had 70% of the market share. And, uh, and this is a very difficult business to be in. There are only four companies. You know, we all are, all, you know, on the, we've had lean years, our cycles, right? We have, we're a cyclical, even numbered years, we generate lots of revenue. Odd number years, you know, we look to municipal uh, jurisdictions, but the biggest, so so we're like this, and, and being in a business like this, with the front load costs of designing a product and paying for the development and the certification really eliminates competition. So the, the courts said, look, you know, let's settle this, let's not go to court, because you're gonna lose. And so, um, so two companies approached the Department of Justice and made bids to acquire the intellectual property. And Dominion won. And so Premier had 200 employees. We were acquired by ESNS. They fired 150 employees. They kept 50. And and 13 of us moved to Dominion. And then they fired, well, there's like 10 left. She was so, 13 that were left, huh? <laughs> no, I was with 13 that moved. Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and Irene, too? Yeah, and Irene. Anything else? No, we're here. You're back in call, so. Well, this is it. Uh, it is one o'clock. So this is your meeting. We have the the device, the the precinct tabulator that you asked about. 
that would be available if a person didn't want to mail their ballot in. We have it. It's boxed up out here. We can go get it, or we can call it good. So. I believe it's unless you want to say it. I believe it, too. <laughs> and how much did you say the, the other tab yeah, so, would be, though? Right, I'm pulling it right from here. because So I'm going to say $4,000. So it just gives you... You know, it gives you the kind of <clears throat> ballpark picture. So it's twenty five thousand right here, four thousand for that. We get it recorded. Right. Um, so when it comes in higher, we'll see. We'll oh, no, see, I don't see. I I think I prefaced it. Hello, did I say ballpark? <laughs> well, and, you know, we would have to figure out how many of those uh, locations that we we were going to man yeah. or open, or you know, how many additional drop off locations like were just pretty manned. And, I was looking forward to having those conversations in <coughs> the direction that this body wants to see it go. I have some ideas in my head, but, you know, and I think it's a conversation we need to have with the community, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did schedule this meeting until 1.30. It is noticed until 1.30, oh, so if people want to look yeah. at the other equipment, we can, but... We're done with three. Let's go to... Well, it's just, just another scanner by the Canon makes, right? No, it's, no. it's oh, a scan. It looks like the yeah, Yaki both. Oh, it looks like the Yaki. So it looks like the like Yaki. Yeah, what people are used to. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. The ballot and all they would do well, is take see. a ballot, feed it through it. Yeah. I mean, the ballot's going to be familiar to, to your voters. Right. The device looks like an Yaki vote only it's colored black. The ballot yeah. box is a little bit different. So out of curiosity, for instance, like we're renting or leasing or whatever through the AccuVotes. We rent it from the state. But if we bought our own, what would it mean? Like, for instance, I don't know what other communities are here. here but would you guys be in buying your own or would you be leasing like they would lease from us? How does that work? So, yeah. I think the answer to that question is what is the state going to do? I see. Because so, you guys are leasing the, the state too, right? Well, we don't lease, but we, we have a big deal. We have a. We have a, we have a Understanding. MOU. Yeah. So, how is that the electronic <coughs> voting going in Canada? Uh, very well. Uh, we had 18 customers. How's it working this year? How's it working? Like, how uh, do they get their pen or whatever? Okay, so they can go online, uh, register, fill in information that pertains to them. So, say, birth year, uh, as, say, an identifying piece of information, enter their name. If the municipality accepts the registration, so we can set it to auto accept, or you can go through each one and say, okay, good, 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 or match them. Accept this email as a pin, their email address. They take that, that pin, and then they enter that pin on the actual uh, ballot page. Um, what happens is they have to enter the two pieces of information correctly to proceed. Um, actually, before they get to the ballot, an oath comes up. They have to accept the oath. If they don't accept the oath, uh, then Doesn't they get kicked up. Pull yeah. them out. Yeah, so it's an online oath. You accept the oath, get to the ballot. The ballot looks um, as one of these images would. And you can select uh, who you want to vote for for each contest. Given the size of our state, that would be a nice way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you wouldn't wait for days. Exactly. Right. Yes. First yeah. electronically and get the data in. Yeah. Thank you for a snapshot in front of you taking both of you guys. Take a picture of you going. You got a record. Well, and it keeps an image of every single same same way that an image is taken on a, a paper. Right. So it does, it does electronically at, and takes it takes a piece. It does. So if ever if anyone ever wanted to DNA, if you had tabulators, there's a little full these tabulators as well. Uh, you can oh, yeah. print those images and scan them through the uh, machine as well. <laughs> Um, if you had any, like, any they say or, yeah. or any need for that. Well, thank you guys for being here. Well, thank, thank you very much for the opportunity, yeah. and I hope we answered your questions. I hope you did okay. It's fabulous. Okay. Thank you. you did great. Yeah, thank okay. you. Lots of information. Okay, we're down to the last item is audience participation. Anybody want to speak to us on any issue? We've got about three minutes. Yes, Eugene. Hello, my name is Eugene Lieberman. I represent myself. Many of you present, including some from the audience, know who I am and what I represent. Checking the public process and meetings, whether they violate the Open Means Act, and also provide a reasonable opportunity to carry a public meeting. Um, last June, you had a meeting, supposedly. In July, there was a no, no meeting. In August, I approached this body, asked, did you have a meeting in June? 
Uh, I lost the then in September, even though last year was September. Um, and words the same, but I also added September. Um, there was a Bulletin meeting, which came as a surprise to me, the end of the month in August, I mean, end of September, another meeting. Uh, I attended that one too, raised a concern of what we have going in June. Now, um, October, I raised again the same thing I'm saying to you. Instead of getting the straight answers, I get a question which is normally the assembly members don't ask any questions to me. They want to just go on and forget what I say. It's been a common practice. Ernie Hall raised a question. He says, uh, I have a question um, to with regard to uh, I'm getting questions from people where you where you where do you live and you vote, whatever. And to me that was a a question that he already knew the answer. And with a way to distract my questions before the body, and that was successful. Um, and Mr. Trainee appropriately tried to bring it back up. My questions. Amanda may have said and says there is no tape, but still that doesn't give it the answer to the questions. Was there a meeting in June? What if there was a tape? Was it taped? What happened to the tape? What um, September? The information. I mean, this is getting to be bizarre. And then if you have people speaking, they should say who they are. Um, I know one's present, but they should identify themselves. And please, let's just not go any further. There's how many more months do I have to get an acknowledgement to when, what happened to this tape, if there was a tape, if there was a meeting, and if there was not a meeting. Not, this should not go be after this meeting. These answers should be here today. What's the, what's the problem here? Thank you, Jane. Any other comments from the public? If not, get a motion to adjourn. We're done. I have a motion to adjourn. Sorry.